Greetings. Uh, my name is Bill Sang. Uh, I am uh, a pastor in waiting, I guess you can say. Um, I was formerly a part-time pastor at Victory Evangelical Church in Rising Sun, Ohio. Kind of a small town and small church that I uh, pastored at for a while. Um, I'm posting some of my sermons uh, from that church online now, uh, partly for the sake of churches searching uh, for a pastor to be able to review my work and also uh, just for the sake of getting the good word out there uh, on a grander level, it's kind of one of my efforts to uh, become more technologically operational, uh, technologically literate, I guess you can say. Um, and uh, for the first series I'm going to be recording here online on YouTube, <coughs> it's going to be uh, actually an Easter series uh, that I'm posting, a uh, three-part series, um, and it deals with uh, uh, the parallels between certain things that happened at creation and at the cross. I hope that you enjoy these messages, and I hope they speak to your heart. First message I, I have here is uh, called Trouble in Paradise. <clears throat> Everyone thinks that the spots of greatest temptation are the dastardly places of society. I can think of several places that would qualify as the center of evil. The adult store, the back alley, the bar, anywhere considered to be a hot spot for the dregs of society. Nonetheless, there are the places, uh, these are the places where you must make an honest effort to go without fear of what others may think of you because clearly these are the places you identify yourself with and you know what other people think about them and how, may, how others may judge you for going there. Therefore, when you think about it, the times when we as Christians are most tempted are not the close encounters with these places or the fact that our eyes may make contact with these locations. We know what people would think of us for disgracing ourselves by taking part in filth openly. No, our greatest temptation occurs in paradise. Our greatest temptation happens in the garden. Let's discuss what I mean here. Let's begin by reading John 18.1. When Jesus had spoken these words, he went out with his disciples over the uh, brook Kidron where there was a garden where he and his disciples entered. Now John does not tell us all of the details about what happened in the garden. So to get some detail, let's look at Matthew 26, verses 36 through 45. Then Jesus came with them to a place called Gethsemane and said to the disciples, sit here while, uh, sit here while I go and pray over there. And he took with him Peter and the two sons of Zebedee, and he began to be sorrowful and deeply depressed. Then he said to them, My soul is exceedingly sorrowful, even to death. Stay here and watch with me. He went a little farther and fell on his face and prayed, saying, O oh my Father, if it is possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. Then he came to the disciples and found them sleeping and said to Peter, What? Could you not watch with me one hour? Watch and pray, lest you enter into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. Again a second time, he went away and prayed, saying, O oh my father, if this cup cannot pass away from me unless I drink it, your will be done. And he came and found them asleep again, for their eyes were heavy. So he left them, went away again, and prayed the third time, saying the same words. Then he came to his disciples and said to them, are you still sleeping and resting? Behold, the hour is at hand, and the Son of Man is being betrayed into the hands of sinners. Why were his disciples asleep? Why could they not take the impending danger that Jesus was warning them about seriously? John is a little more direct concerning what happened at the garden. Once he introduced the change of scenery from the high priestly prayer of Jesus to the garden, or Gethsemane, he speaks of the evil that was awaiting Jesus and his disciples. John 18, 2 and 3 say, And Judas who betrayed him also knew the place, for Jesus often met there with his disciples. Then Ju Judas, having received a detachment of troops and officers from the chief priests and Pharisees, came there with lanterns, torches, and weapons. Treachery through and through awaited our Messiah inside of the garden. Notice that the garden was not thought of as a place of danger, but a place of comfort. 
The text tells us that Jesus often met there with, with his disciples. This was somewhere where Jesus would preach, teach, and fellowship with his disciples in holy unity. Why were the disciples asleep? Because that is our natural tendency when we are resting in the garden. I think that the Lord wants us to think about the symmetry between this garden scene and the garden scene all the way back in Genesis. Let us observe the similarities that exist between the two gardens. First of all, Gethsemane was a place where Jesus often taught his disciples. It is still a popular idea among Christians that nature draws us closer to God. When we look at nature, we cannot help but to see beauty in God's creation. Notice that Jesus taught within a garden and not a field. A field is typically uniform in regards to the crop being harvested. <clears throat> it is not meant to be beautiful. It is sort of a way of mass producing food. The purpose of a garden and a field are different. A garden, on the other hand, has great diversity. It can have flowers, fruits, vegetables, and has more capability to show off the beauty of nature than a field does. The plot of ground that God prepared for mankind to live was called the Garden of Eden. Eden literally means paradise, so this garden was beyond compare. When Melissa and I went down to Kentucky to the Creation Museum, they sport a spectacular botanical garden like you wouldn't believe. It is incredible, but as incredible as what that was, it would have paled in comparison to the garden that God created for man to dwell in. It was rich with food, appealing smells, color, and was just a safe place where God could teach mankind more about himself in perfect fellowship with himself. Second, in both instances, God knew the danger that lurked, lurked in the garden. At Gethsemane, it mentions specifically that Jesus knew what awaited him there. He did not try to avoid the evil that was approaching. Instead, he prayed to God to deliver him from evil, but to accomplish his will regardless. In Eden, there lurked another danger that was more clearly defined, but more subtle as a threat. I refer to the, no the tree of knowledge of good and evil. Just to reemphasize for the sake of refuting naysayers, uh, it is not the tree of knowledge but the tree of knowledge of good and evil. Adam and Eve were not stupid, and God was not withholding knowledge from Adam and Eve. In fact, he made the knowledge of good and evil accessible to Adam and Eve by placing the tree in their midst in the Garden of Eden. The tree itself was not evil, but in order for mankind to taste its fruit, they had to do something that went against the nature of mankind. Do that which, is, which was evil. God's command was very direct. You may eat the fruit from any of the trees, except that from the tree of knowledge of good and evil. Mankind's disobedient, uh, diso disobedience defiled its own nature and then opened its eyes up to the evil it had committed. Its response then was to hide from the Lord, who they had open communion with. But this would not have happened had those in the garden been awake to obey God's command. This brings me to my third point, which is that Jesus' disciples fell asleep in the garden when he was deeply distressed. When the Lord knew that evil was approaching and was threatening his soul and souls and the souls of his friends, those who were his disciples slept when he said to pray. True, Jesus was going to be apprehended one way or another. It was his destiny. But had his disciples obeyed Jesus and prayed, Peter may not have denied Jesus, the disciples may not have scattered, and Judas may not have committed suicide. Jesus knew the gravity of the situation. <clears throat> he wanted them to pray, both for him, that he would be able to endure this treacherous hour, but also for themselves, that they would not fall into temptation. The spirit was willing, but the body was weak, and they failed. At Eden, you might wonder how this applied. My question for you, where was Adam when Eve ate from the tree of knowledge of good and evil? Different people have different answers, but one of the more popular answers is that Adam was asleep, but he was very present. In Eve's hour of temptation, 
when they basked in the shade of the tree of knowledge of good and evil, Adam did not consider the temptation that his mate could face while looming in the midst of the tree. True, they had not, they had not the fear of evil in their hearts and could not fathom the horrors of death which God had warned them about. But Adam could have feared the Lord's command. Do not eat from the tree of knowledge of good and evil. Whether he was asleep, literally or metaphorically, had Adam been awake for just one more hour to guide Eve, to warn Eve, and to pray for Eve, the present condition of the world would not be the mess that we live in. It would be the paradise that they dwelt in for a short while. <clears throat> but the greatest similarity between these two gardens would be betrayal. In both cases, betrayal happened against God by his creation. In Eden, the serpent deceived God. He was created as a crafty creature, but he first gave into Satan's evil spell and used his talents for evil rather than for good. Eve then betrayed God by disturbing him, distrusting him rather, and not believing that he really was looking after the best interests of mankind. Adam betrayed God by disregarding his command and falling in suit with his wife. It was one betrayal after another, and in Genesis chapter 6, long after this fact, we read that mankind had caused God to grieve. God's love was sold by his creation for a piece of fruit. At Gethsemane, we all know that it was Judas who ultimately betrayed Jesus. He sold him to the authorities for 30 pieces of silver. He led the troops over to Jesus and identified him by kissing him the way that a disciple would kiss, would, would, would kiss his rabbi. God, once again, was betrayed. It's sadly funny that you have a New Testament version of the blame game as well. You know, in the garden, when God asked Adam what he did, he said, The woman that you put here made me eat. And Eve said, The serpent that you put here made me eat. Everyone passed the blame to someone else when they are solely responsible for their own actions. In the New Testament, I would say that this kind of paralleled uh, is, is kind of paralleled by the arrogance of the disciples. In one of the accounts of when Peter told Jesus that he would never deny him, it records that all of the other disciples fell in line and said, Neither will I. Ironically, Every one of them fell away from him as they were scattered by his arrest. In a sense, they are pre presumptuously passing the blame game, uh, passing the blame on to one another and claiming that Jesus was incorrect about his judgment concerning who would do what. No, Je no Jesus, it will not be me who denies you. You ought to mean Philip. Certainly cannot mean I, Lord. But perhaps you are talking about James. Lord. Why would I ever betray you? I belong at your right or left side. I think that maybe Thomas would be capable of such a thing, though. I know I'm creating hypo a hypothetical situation, but one way or another, they were claiming that Jesus was wrong by trying to justify themselves. Maybe they should have just listened to Jesus and prayed when he asked them to. When God has brought us to paradise, that is the time when we are most likely to fall into, into, into temptation. When we fall into temptation, that is when we are most likely to sin. That is why I tell you that even though we must be aware of the evils of the world, the thorns and th thistles that infest the, the brush that we scurry through to find our meat for the day, we must be aware of the fruit we are eating before we declare ourselves righteous. It is always for arrogance that we fall from grace. But we have had an advocate before the beginning of time. God always steps up to the plate whenever he sees those he loves straying away from him. In Genesis, you might recall God's action to, over, to, to cover the sin of Adam and Eve. He provided the skins of two animals for them to wear his clothes to cover their nakedness. I've said it before and I will say it again. In order for Adam and Eve to have worn the skins of animals, two animals had to have died in order to provide those skins. God presented the first sacrifices to cover over sin so that his image, mankind, that was created in his image, 
would not be permanently tarnished. It was only through this act that they could have a relationship with God. Notice that Adam and Eve presented no solution to their problem. C.S. Lewis puts it brilliantly in his book, Mere Christianity. He stated in his book that repentance is difficult. To, to do an about-face from your sins and walk in righteousness cannot be accomplished by those who are bad. It takes a good man to be able to repent. The problem is that a good man does not need to repent. Only a bad man needs to repent, and he is incapable of doing so. What an awful, awful predicament we are left in as a result. But in John's Gospel, the 18th chapter, Jesus steps up to the plate, just as God always does, and heroically offers himself. Jesus, therefore, knowing all things that would come upon him, went forward and said to them, Whom are you seeking? They answered him, Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus said to them, I am he. They drew back and fell to the ground. Jesus answered, I have told you that, that I am he. Therefore, if you seek me, let these go their way. God once again delivered mankind by delivering a sacrifice. Certainly, there is no reason why the authorities should have arrested Jesus' disciples. But that did not matter to them. They were crooked. They were not only going to take Jesus in, but anybody affiliated with him. But Jesus made it clear. No, only me. That is who you came for. Man did not have, have it in him to get out of the mess of a situation in the garden. We could not have pulled ourselves out of our sin and misery because we are not good. We should be grateful that God was in the garden of, uh, both in Eden and at Gethsemane. Had it not been for God, our comfort would have di uh, digressed to temptation and our temptation into sin and our sin into death. But God's presence in the garden meant grave consequences for him. It was made known that the price was not paid in the garden. When we fall short of God's glory through our sin and failure, we need a God that can redeem us and buy us back from the grip of the wicked one. God's presence in the garden would need to be transferred to a tree. The tree of life would need to be removed from paradise and placed atop Golgotha. Next week, we will discuss God's presence on the cross.